senior lecturer in the division. And Maya um, will be speaking about a topic which is uh, near and dear, sometimes with trauma, to <laughs> many of our hearts, which is publishing. And talking to us about um, uh, what I'm sure many of us are aware of, we, we've, uh, we receive daily emails, often from Leslie, about, uh, <laughs> about predatory publishing and predatory publishers in the health sciences. And Maya will be speaking about the issues um, that we all face uh, in an environment where we pay to publish and we're told that we publish or perish, perish which reduces by the transitive property of mathematics to pay or <laughs> perish, which is not a nice situation to be in and certainly what no one intends. So Maya, I'll hand over to you. We'll go for about 40 minutes and then uh, hopefully have a robust discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think Landon was a little overambitious in uh, suggesting what I talk about. Um, uh, broadly, I think about uh, paying, publishing, and perishing in roughly that order. 
Um, and just to set up, um, set up the talk a little bit, I'm going to just uh, sort of outline the framework typically of academic publishing as it, as it routinely happens now, in case there are sort of junior colleagues who haven't been in long enough to um, donate their free labor to editorial <laughs> boards or to peer review or uh, haven't been the ones signing off on the invoices for the thousand pound, two thousand dollar um, publication fees. And so uh, publishing has changed a lot uh, recently, but the key stakeholders are still there. Essentially, we have still the producers of the original content, and that fundamentally are the researchers, the students, um, both in academia and in private sector who contribute to research and then, and then wish to disseminate it. Uh, the funders of the researcher, uh, which are done, the funders of the research, and this often goes down to government. So it's taxpayer funded or private organizations such as Wellcome Trust, for example, that are sitting on equity capital. Um, we have now uh, content distributors. Traditionally, this was uh, scientific um, groups like the Royal Society or the chemistry people or whatever they're called. Um, these days, it's uh, typically for-profit publishing companies, so businesses that distribute our content for us. And then the consumers of the content, that's us again, so the primary consumers are the primary producers, but also there are consumers in, in uh, public sector and government, NGOs, and for example, uh, non-academic affiliated healthcare workers, um, so doctors in private practice and such. Usually the consumption of academic publishing happens via intermediaries, for, so via libraries traditionally, and increasingly via an online portal of some form, often which requires a fee. And just to get us started, and so you can see which where my bias goes, um, the people that produce the work, so academics, we're judged by that work. We need to publish because it's it's how we get promotions, it's how we get merit awards, it's how we're recognized. Um, the distributors, the publishers, have profit margins in general in excess of thirty percent. I'll show you some data on that. It's better than the banks, and it's better than the tech companies. Um, consumers, particularly non-academic affiliated consumers, have difficulty accessing literature. It costs money, and even the academic affiliated consumers um, with the libraries seeing reduced budgets are having difficulty accessing uh, the literature. And then finally, most of the labor in the cycle of academic publishing is done for free by the producers of the, um, of the work who are the academics. Okay, so this is ages ago, this is from 2009, but even the cartoons are in on it. Okay, so scientists give us the work for free, and then we have volunteer scientists review it for free, and then we bundle it up and charge them a lot of money. Okay, that is academic publishing in a nutshell. So we pay. We pay a whole bunch of ways now. Our school ways. So this is a nice analogy. Obstetrician, setting a practice, we know how obstetricians normally work. You get a fee for your services, you help people deliver babies. Under this new model, you've decided that the only way, the, the better way to do it is to actually, the parents need to give you the baby and you'll lease it back to them, as long as they pay your annual subscription fee. <laughs> Ludicrous, but it's actually precisely what the academic sort of world has decided to do, it's what the scientific community has done. <coughs> So academic publishing is a business, and this isn't a crime. Okay, we accept capitalist business, we accept that business needs to make a profit, and we accept that businesses uh, are there, and we accept businesses that sort of are um, responsible only to their shareholders. Okay, and we accept that in, a, in most of our lives, unless you live in uh, certain countries who don't accept capitalism. Okay, so, but the academic, Publishers get most of the work done for free because academics volunteer their time to peer review, they volunteer their time to sit on editorial boards, and they are the creators of the content. Okay, And then we pay the publishers to distribute, often, so we pay a publication fee, and then we buy our papers back from the distributors. Okay? And we usually have to do that because in order for us to publish, the publishers have also required us to give them copyright. And now they own the work, and we get to pay for it back. So it's a dream business for generating profit because your labor's free and you're not doing much work. And so they generate profit. So uh, Real Save gets, gets picked on a little bit just because they're the largest. Okay? 
all the publishing companies, the big, the big ones are like this, and many of the smaller ones as well. So they've averaged uh, a profit margin over 30% in each of the last 15 years, and they currently generate more than two billion pounds in revenue per year. Okay, so it's an immensely profitable business. Um, in their 2016 uh, report, so the parent company is Relics, they said that their underlying profit growth is slightly exceeding the underlying revenue growth. So their profit margins are in fact increasing year on year. They're doing better and better. Okay, they estimate they publish 16% of the world's scientific articles right now, alone. Although smaller, <coughs> Spring and Wiley, or Spring and Nature, Wiley, Blackwell, Taylor, Francis, and the rest of them, um, they all have similar profit margins, and together the top five publishers are responsible for publishing about 50% of all scientific articles. Now, for, for Jan. And then, because it's so profitable, there's a whole bunch of newcomers. And the newcomers, we call them predatory publishers, but it, in effect, the, the differentiation between a predatory publisher and a legacy publisher is very <coughs> small. And I mean, as an example, Asavia, between 2000 and 2005, their Australian arm published six journals, which were uh, fully sponsored by pharma, and they didn't disclose that sponsorship. Okay, so these were just pharma these were just pharmaceutical propaganda journals, functionally. They were paid for by pharma and not disclosed. They looked like medical journals. They looked like peer-reviewed medical journals. So we pay to publish our paper, to make it open access so other people can read it. And the fees there are $1,000 to $3,000 on average, um, with some journals uh, varying. Some of Elsevier's Cell, I think, is the $5,000 US for a publication fee. Okay, so that's a top-rated journal and has uh, an associated fee with it. In 2010, the estimated mean charge for an open access article was $700. That's increased. Um, certainly. And then we pay again, and we pay again in a particularly um, negative way, in the sense that the publishers typically require copyright from us in order to publish our work. And the copyright's not theirs and they shouldn't have it. We should never sign this over. They've not created the property, and in the essence of copyright law is that the intellectual property belongs to the consumer, or to the producer of that. Um, for the publishers, copyright's a mechanism to ensure their profit stream is consistent because they now own the, own, own the rights to it and so they can control the access to it. And it's also a mechanism by which they can succeed at lawsuits because once again, they own something now. It has sort of a, a long history of things. And there's lots of things wrong with copyright and there's not time enough to talk about why. That in this talk. And, and they're resorting to, um, sort of subversive means to ensure that they get this, this intellectual property, which really doesn't belong to them, including sort of uh, coy things like special access in which they claim. So the typical open access thing is that you, you pay to have open access and you get to retain your intellectual property. And they, they make claims that you are retaining your intellectual property, but in fact you sign over all rights over that. So you retain it technically, but you're not allowed to decide what to do with it, who can read it, how to do other things with it, who gets to use it, which means you don't, you don't effectively own that, own that property anymore. So now we paid to get our article out there, but what if you want to read it? Well, you have to buy it back. Okay? And, and so we have these... Uh, uh, now, uh, online, these single-use, sort of single viewings, so for 24 hours, you can rent access to an article that is not under an open access sort of model. And it is $30 to $50 is the average fee. Okay. And it disproportionately impacts uh, lower-income countries and countries that don't have very strong research infrastructures because their universities and libraries have not bought into the generalized access of the publishers. And so $30, for example, for a doctor working in Cambodia who wants to find out about, wants to read the systematic review on the treatment of hypertension or whatever, might not be feasible. But this has, this has potential real implications on people's actual lives. And then we pay again, and we pay again through our libraries, and most academics don't see this um, because we don't get to see the library budgets. But they're vast, and I didn't spend a ton of time looking for recent numbers, but in 2014, 
Uh, the estimated expenditure for subscriptions was 180 million pounds for the UK universities alone. The library budgets don't keep up with inflation, and this is across the board. They're, they're, they're decreasing in real terms uh, annually. And uh, right now, a full subscription to Elsevier is about a million dollars, US dollars. One publisher, mind you. That's one publisher. So, um, and we're not going to feel sorry for Harvard. Okay, Harvard's one of the wealthiest universities in the world. They've got an endowment worth of a billion, a billion dollars. But back in 2010, um, they sent a memo around saying actually that journals are too expensive. They were paying $3.75 million a year in subscription fees. For work that is being produced by other people and the review. Okay. And the value that the journals add. So the journals, the publishers will tell you that they do this value added process and they do all this stuff and it's very important and very useful. In 2000, way back in 2005, Deutsche Bank uh, did a careful investigation and they concluded the publisher adds relatively little value to the publishing process. If it were as complex, costly, and value added as they claim, 40% margins would not be possible. And then, far from assisting with the dissemination of researchers, the publishers actually impede it. Their turnaround times are long. So, because of these incredibly pro this incredibly profitable business and the low real cost of publishing online journals, and I'll come to those later, we've got a, a flourishing of a set of what are really pay to publish journals. Okay, so it's called predatory sometimes, but effectively you pay them a fee and they publish your paper. That's how it works. They might rather cross little bits and things in there, but that's just that's how it works. Um, they feel, they're feeling a distinct need, actually. And they're feeling a need because academics need to publish, and, and, and even uh, increasingly uh, academics from lower middle income countries who don't have strong re research infrastructures, who are paying sometimes for their research out of their own pockets, need to publish. And they need to publish if they want promotions, if they want recognition, and if they want sort of all the things a career in, in academic research. And they can't afford the open access fees paid by the legacy publishers. So these pay to publish predatory publishers have come in and said, well, for $100, we'll publish your paper. It's a peer reviewed. It's got, a, it's got a, a, an editorial panel. It's got a nice name because they like to mimic the names of legitimate journals. So instead of the Journal of Chemical, International Journal of Chemical Engineering, it's the International Journal of Chemical Engineers. And really, when you're looking at a CV, like, do you notice a difference? Not so much. Not so much. Okay. Academics need to publish, and so these these pay to publish um, online journals are filling need, and it's one of the reasons that they're flourishing. So we publish, publish a lot. Right now, it's estimated about 2.5 million scientific manuscripts are published each year across, say, 30,000 active uh, legacy journal, um, legacy publisher journals. And um, for example, and, and I mean, so this is, it's so profitable that in 2016, we Xavier launched 64 new journals. So every year, the large publishers are launching more and more, especially these online and gold open access journals, because they're phenomenally profitable. Um, and uh, so Rita Sevier in 2015, and you can get this from their uh, annual reports and stuff, they had 1.3 million manuscripts submitted across all their journals, and more than 700,000 free peer reviews donated. And just to make a point of this, 700,000 free peer reviews <laughs> on an average Review time, which is from somewhere referenced there, but uh, that's more than 3.5 million hours of free labor. Okay, that's 300, that's 400 per 24 hour person years of labor for free for one publisher in one year. So there's a real cost to academics to keeping this uh, economic publishing system going. Yeah, that's actually. That's, Sort of stunning. I don't spend five hours per review, but at any rate, you, it doesn't matter. You can take a zero off and it's still horrifying. So the predatory journals or the paid to publish journals have grown rapidly. And unfortunately, the, 
the estimates of this have been very difficult because they're kind of fly by night, like random website based in India, but apparently with an address in America. Um, from an estimated 1800 in 2010 to sort of more than 4,000 now. Um, and about 150,000 <laughs> articles per year plus are being published by these, and the majority of those articles fall into engineering or biomedical. Okay, so the, the, we're, the, we're one of the, the medical sciences are one of the big growth areas for these publishers. Um, and the authors are increasingly widely distributed. When this, this start, phenomenon started, it was more restricted to the sort of uh, Asian subcontinent, to, to sort of India. Uh, but this is, it's, it's diversified rapidly, and so there's an estimated 15 to 20 percent of authors are coming from African countries, and for comparison, there's an estimated 6 to 12 percent coming from the U.S. countries. And um, many people are caught out, so McGill University did a, a review recently, and they found something like 70 or 80 of their researchers had a predatory publication. Some of these are being legitimately defrauded, other people are not so much. So these are inexpensive to publish in. They look mostly the same. It's difficult to tell the difference. And it gets you a publication. So who are they? Um, Beale's list is probably quite well known. He did a blacklist of predatory publishers for a number of years. He was pressured by his university to take that down, so it's now gone. And he wasn't always right, and he was quite controversial, I think, but he, he brought a, a useful discussion. And so, um, but I mean, there are real damages being being caused by the, these predatory publishers, particularly the ones that are, are more fraudulent. So these are the ones that are mimicking existing journal names. So uh, there's an example for a conference, but it's sort of like the conference is International Conference of Cancer, the real one, with a hyphen, and they take the hyphen away and make their own sort of conference. Okay, so it's the, the direct mimicry. They uh, put up fraudulent editorial boards where they steal people's pictures and sometimes their bios and don't bother telling them that they're on this editorial board and this sort of thing. Um, of course, peer review doesn't really happen and, and there is a real, there's, a, there's real damage being caused there because they confuse the public, they reduce trust in the scientific process and they take advantage particularly of young and inexperienced researchers who predominantly, again, are coming from lower middle income countries with the way the research infrastructure isn't as well developed. Um, South Africa, of course, is not immune. Um, so there's a very recent paper in South African Journal of Science um, that estimated that sort of more than 4,000 articles between 2005 and 2017 were published in the predatory journals. This partially came off Beale's list and partially it was the authors of this investigation. And UCT is not immune. UCT is on the, there it is, the third from the bottom. Oops, oh, I forgot this touch screen. Third from the bottom, UCT. Strong predatory evidence, 40 papers. Weak evidence, four papers. Total predatory, 44. Okay, it's a tiny percentage of the whole number of publications, but nevertheless, it's it now impacts all of us. Sorry, Mike, yeah. will you take questions? No, 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 no unless it's really important. Could you just read it? Sort of, those of us in the back are our eyes aren't good. Could you just tell us what the table is? It's just a table, it's just from this paper that's referenced of the predatory uh, publications in South Africa at South African universities. UCT is one of the lines. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Olivia Dahl sat on an editorial board of seven journals for a long time. Um, these, uh, these publishers, they just need uh, editorial members, it doesn't really matter who they are. Um, and, but, but I mean, editorial board membership has traditionally been a measure of esteem. So, and we all now get spam on a daily basis asking us to, well, for our esteem detention, to be an editorial board member on a journal that sounds like relatively legit. And the spam's getting better and better. So you actually have to read them now to say, oh, no, you're not. Okay. Um, And then finally, we're addicted to the brand. So if you speak to other researchers, they'll generally agree with you. The publishing model's flawed. It's not quite working the way it should. Uh, impact factor doesn't point to quality. Okay, so impact factor is a measure of the journal's impact as citations over things, but that's all gamed. And improved accessibility of research is a good idea. Okay, but so name brand recognition is still king here.
And so universities are giving away a valuable product for free, and they're paying billions of dollars to buy that. And then they've outsourced, we've outsourced quality judgments to brand recognition. And I want to talk a little bit about brand recognition now, and also just break this up a little bit. Okay, so is a paper that's been cited 45 times in a journal with an impact factor of 54, this is a real quiz, guys, uh, better than a paper that's been cited four times in a journal with an impact factor of eight, Landon, you are excluded from answering this since you've already seen this. Yes, no? Yes? Um, medical. Medical. Just can't remember my example. Yes? Are, we, yes. are, you, are you guys are saying yes? Okay. Are you sure? And can you be sure without reading the paper? Yeah. Oh, you're going to change your mind, all of you. Okay, well, the front people change their mind. So this was a trick question, of course. It's exactly the same paper. So there was a, a it, it, it's an editorial. Fundamentally, okay, but it's clinical trial registration looking back and moving ahead. It was published originally in mid 2007. It was republished in a whole bunch of journals, sort of in the next set of years. It's an identical paper. It went in New England Journal of Medicine, which of course has a very high impact factor, and it was also published in the Croatian Medical Journal and the Journal Canadian Medical Journal. And these are places that have populations of like 50, and are therefore only two doctors, and so you're, you're not going to see this sort of um, citation. So for any individual paper, actually, impact factor is meaningless. Because remember, impact factor is the mean over all of the papers in a journal. And so things like readership and the number of articles they publish and the number of citations they allow in their articles, all of these things are gained very well known by the publishers. And then if you ask lay people, the internet's great for quotes like this, why would anyone ever give away their copyright on a paper and even pay for publishing? Or layperson who's not attached to academics. Uh, because for very stupid reasons, universities judge academic performance based on how many times you've been published. Or how many times you've been published in a journal that we respect. So how many times have you been published in a brand name that we recognize? Okay, and the policies that, these policies, these academic policies around uh, promotion recognition and status for academic researchers are the policies that created the academic publishing business. They are the reason that we have such a business. And we have to deal with them and we must publish because our job depends on us publishing. I can't just walk away. <coughs> but yeah. So we're the problem. Okay. We're the problem because our committee members don't read the research, our promotion people don't read the research, our hiring committees don't read the research. They say, oh, but that one's in McDonald's. <laughs> What's that weird family restaurant? I don't recognize that one. And make a quality assessment on the basis of that without seeing the work, okay? So we're the problem. <coughs> so, we're going to perish anyway. We publish, we publish a lot, we're publishing 25 million articles a year. And so I'm not alone in this sort of sense, in that this publisher parish environment, <coughs> outsourcing of uh, evaluation of quality to mere metrics, the use of managers instead of academics to uh, make decisions in terms of promotion and status and award and all of these sorts of things. Um, has uh, been driven by the published and perished environment, the very competitive scientific environment to develop countries and now impacts particular low middle income countries to a high degree. Okay, so don't read this whole thing. I uh, just say the stats in this article are really dodgy, but one of the things that they think about is, uh, unlike many <laughs> other um, writers, these predatory journals aren't tricking everybody. People are taking calculated risks because they're getting evaluated on how long their list of publications is, yeah? How long their list of publications is with a title that looks like it's normal. And they're saying, well, the people that are evaluating this aren't checking, and they're not checking. We know they're not checking. Okay, so I'll take a risk, I'll pay $100. Now I've got something in the International Journal of Chemical Engineers. Great. Okay, and the other, and the other, the other thing that these authors point out, which is, which is quite relevant, I think, is they say that 
Um, basically, the people that are, are forced or, or um, using these sorts of uh, predatory pay to publish journals are part of a structurally unjust global system that excludes them from publishing in the high quality journals because the high quality journals are too expensive and too exclusive and not actually evaluating research again. They're evaluating your networks of who's your senior author, what lab you come from, what university are you associated to, and that this disproportionately impacts countries with less developed research um, things. So the university administration and our, our uh, bean counters are not protecting the resources that the university produces. The librarians are just copyright police now. They don't really do a job of it, like yell at people for breaking copyright. And, and uh, there's not enough time to talk about the demise of the libraries and how sad that is, but that's, that's obviously a problem. And then the, the, the professors, the senior and tenured professors that have um, perhaps weight to add to this and perhaps sit on editorial boards or, or are managing editors fail to speak up when they know the system's wrong. And as this um, slowly shifts, uh, publishers are starting to fight back. They form lobby groups that actively lobby the government. So for example, the NIH tried a while ago to make some changes to the, uh, the funding and open access things. Um, half of those got curtailed because of lobby groups paid for by the publishing companies. They embrace uh, sneak IP theft, so intellectual property, and they start lawyering up. And when they start lawyering up, there are real consequences. Um, and one of them I want to draw attention to is a, a hacker named Aaron Schwartz. He downloaded a million or several um, uh, PDF files from an archive called JSTOR, which is, it takes kind of legacy, legacy journals. He spent two years being pursued very actively by MIT, which is an academic institution, uh, and various uh, publishing companies and the Department of Justice, so he was facing charges that would have led to 35 years imprisonment and then committed suicide. There are many cases now, so in the uh, uh, various various um, lawsuits being won by publishing companies against people who've downloaded, who've downloaded, both downloaded uh, PDF files. Yes, they are breaking copyright law, and that's the reason that publishers insist that you give them their copyright. Okay. Taxpayer funded scholarly work. Felony offense. Um, um, Jeffrey Beale, I'm not going to talk about. He he had to shut down his list of predatory publishers because his, he was threatened with his job. The university essentially said, "We're going to fire you if, unless you take it down." And the pressure that was applied to the university by the publishers was essentially harassment. They harassed all of the senior decision makers. They called them. They wrote them letters. They sent lies about his work. His uh, they called into question his research. Okay, and they just they just put pressure on the university until the university came. This incentive structure of insisting on lots of publications without real real checking or regard to quality basically incentivizes now sloppy and fraudulent work. Okay. Meticulous, honest scientists are going to publish slower and they will not get the rewards. Um, this is Jeffrey Beale particularly in medicine, there's no longer a clear line where legitimate medical research ends and unsound medical research begins because the fake medical journals, um, now paid for by the nutraceutical companies, the drug companies, the like random eat some gold and you'll feel better tomorrow companies, um, look just like peer-reviewed medical journals. They've got editorial boards with doctors and things and things like that. <coughs> can't tell the difference. Um, estimated that 80,000 patients to foreign clinical trials based on research that was later withdrawn between 2000 and 2010. This is uh, what you know about, of course, what you don't know about you can't count, but as an estimate. And to say that open access isn't necessarily the answer, so it's part of the answers, or, or, or like public and freely readable uh, research is part of the answer, but it's not enough. And particularly because open access journals in the author pays model where I pay $1,000 to publish my article. I've just done this recently, we're all hypocritical. So I paid a thousand pounds to publish my article. The journal, they did correct a few typos, it's true. 
<laughs> so, um, because, because it's revenue for them, and so there's a great deal, there's a conflict for them. They could, they could really critically evaluate the science and say, no, 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 no. Or they could make more money and say, yes, 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 yes. And remember, they're businesses. Their job is to make money, not to patrol the quality of science that goes on. So actually, of course, they're going to take the job to science. It's money. That's their job. They're making money. Um, and so the publishers aren't really the villains here. They're doing what they should do as a business that needs to be profitable. They're maximizing profit for their shareholders, who are the only people they are accountable to. And so, if, for example, if you want to read about open access and predatory publishing in the Journal of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Neonatal Nursing, you can pay 55, 20 US dollars. Okay, behind a paywall about how bad predatory journals are. <laughs> Peer review is irredeemably broken. It doesn't work anymore. It probably hasn't worked for a long time. Okay? And there's so many examples that you just, these, I've only pulled funny ones. Okay? In 2010, NASA, in a huge press conference, announced the first known microorganism <laughs> on Earth able to thrive and reproduce using the toxic chemical arsenic. That like toxic chemical part should be a, 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 an indicator for you. It was published in Science, of course, and Science is the US version of Nature. So it's the top, most important, highly ranked, most important of everything. What assumes peer review. This experiment had they had no real controls and they took at face value that there was like no phosphorus or something in the sample. So of course there was phosphorus and the, the little bacteria were not using arsenic. They were just really tough. Okay. So it was wrong. In nature, um, so this is there was a, something called a stem cell. It's a stem cell, and they said, we made these stem cells, and you can turn them into any other kind of cell, and this is amazing, and now we can do, um, you can like patient, patient match them and repair everything. Fantastic. Published in Nature. He was later found guilty of academic misconduct. They think that these cells never existed. And in fact, this, I screenshot this yesterday. Can you find the retraction? So it's still there. It does. <laughs> it has, in fact, it's been retracted. It's a tiny little blue link. And I mean, if you're like me, you load a bunch of papers and then you just click on PDF. You keep clicking until you get the PDF, right? I actually put this up saying, it's still up there. Where's the big retraction stamp? No, the retraction stamp's here. There you go. It's been retracted. Okay, this was academic misconduct. They made this data up. And yet nature doesn't want to put a giant red, you know, wrong. Because that's bad for them. And I guess the other thing that comes to this is this was almost a win for the authors. It just it broke a little bit too early that they had been fraudulent. If it had waited a year or two, they would have had their 2,000 citations, their promotions, mm -hmm. and everything else, and then, oh, there was some stuff and whatever. <laughs> Researchers are accustomed and indifferent now to the top journals that we still brand recognize, go, wow, you got a paper in Nature. Actually, we're used to these papers being wrong. And we don't care. Nobody's angry. And then there's so many stings that this does not even this one. It, the only reason this one's interesting because they sent it to 300 papers, uh, 300 journals, 51% acceptance rate, and clause one was one of the few journals to point out there were actual scientific and ethical flaws. There were no controls, and they they did something horrible. It was minus this little horrible to the mice. Okay, all fake. It was written by a computer program. And, but the thing is, this was accepted by journals hosted by the legacy publishers, not just these predatory, predatory publishers that you're like, oh, well, they don't have any control, but the legacy journals, and by academic institutions, and by scholarly and society journals. We all have this idea that are somehow better and more robust, but there's many of them are being run by the commercial publishers. They're just profit-making machines now. They've got no mandate to do good science. This was a Star Wars one, that was quite entertaining to read. There's like Star Wars monologues, uh -huh. verbatim, in the, in the text. <laughs> um, so, we'll have lots of time for discussion. The current system of academic publishing is, does not serve academics, okay? It's too slow, 
The turnaround time from submission to actual publication is too long. It's phenomenally expensive. The aggregate estimate is 10 billion US dollars a year on publishing in these fields. So the subscri subscri sorry, subscription as well as the payer author pay fee. Um, and just imagine what that money could do, oh, I don't know, not buying back our own intellectual property. Um, it's arbitrary. Peer review is compromised or flawed and journal brand use for, as a proxy for quality. So it's actually, it's, it's not even measuring what we ha would hope that it would measure in the sense that peer review publication was supposed to be a marker of basic quality. It's not doing that anymore. We have flawed, fundamentally flawed experiments being published in the best journals. Okay? This is no marker. It's just a random, it's a random sheet. And it's inaccessible. Um, <coughs> traditionally, it has been inaccessible. But SciHub has changed that, and I'll talk about SciHub just a little bit. <coughs> so SciHub is a mostly illegal, it's a website, it's run uh, now out of Russia. It was developed by a Kazakhstan uh, researcher, single-handedly. Um, there's a little bit of gray somewhere. Um, but she, it's estimated now that 95% of the academic literature is available freely to anyone with whom that connection. This is the first time ever, the first time in history that, that the academic literature is available now if you have an internet connection, okay, or free. Um, so I've got this paper, Open Access and Predatory Publishing, remember the journal of the gynecology people, so I've got it, I can read it now, okay, from Sahab. So, Sahab, about 50% of the searches for Sahab are for journal articles that are already available online, if open access. So people are using it because it's easier, and I mean, you know, you go to the journal, the publisher website, and then you click, and then they give you some stupid HTML thing, and you click on the PDF, and then they send you somewhere else, are you really sure that you want the PDF? You're really sure that you want the PDF, but you've got to click through five annoying web pages later. Or, Sciab delivers you the PDF. So a lot of people are just using it because instead of logging into their university's proxy and putting in their passwords and doing their nonsense, they can just get it. Okay? So it's actually just, it's part of its access, just easy. Um, now, Sci-Hub's model relies on making copyrighted works available in contravention of the copyright <coughs> holder's desires. The copyright holders, remember, are the publishing companies who demand copyright for you to publish your paper publish somewhere. Okay, so, um, and, and, then, and in some sense, so, the founder says that she, this is actually necessary civil disobedience, and I would kind of agree with her. It's not right, and this is not the right answer to, to fixing academic publishing, but it was necessary. Um, and in many ways, Sai was just doing what US publishers did for a very long time, which is to not recognize copyright in other countries. Uh, and I mean, this was US official government policy for more, more than 100 years, and Scientific American had fits when when it, when it changed. Um, she's, been, she's been sued successfully by El Saibera and, and others, and I think the award, the damages were something like $100,000 per paper done, and there were, you know, there were millions of them. I mean, it's, it's, she didn't show up, so she was, she was found guilty in absentia, but I mean, I wouldn't go to America to face a lawsuit either. <laughs> um, so, uh, so they won, and they won because they own copyright, and she has technically broken copyright law. Well, they shouldn't have the copyright, but that's, that's the thing. So is there good news? There's some. Uh, people are, that's my timer, so I'm almost done. People are um, starting to think serious about this. How do you assess research? There's a, there's a thing called DORA now, uh, it's Declaration on Research Assessment, which is, they're starting to think about what are better ways to assess research quality other than impact factor and citations and this sort of thing. And similarly, the lead manifesto is very much in that, in that um, vein. And then slow science and bulletins of bad science are both kind of movements saying that we are going to reject your publish everything as flashy as possible, never mind double checking the results. That's okay. 
if you double check them, we might not have that fancy number, which gets us into science, yeah? Um, and then people are starting to think seriously about, about peer review and about how to fix peer review and how to make it effective and for what it needs to be, okay? And, and so that's an F1000. The German universities are fighting back, I think fairly successfully, sort of. Probably at the end of the year, the two biggest universities in Germany, will their contracts with, with El Servier will um, end and they're not going to renew them. It's the weirdest thing your lab does for historical superstitious reasons. Publishing journals. Okay, journals are flipping, and by flipping it means that the entire editorial board at one time resigns, and then they start the journal and they take all of the prestige and everything with them. That's a new name, but effectively they're removing their journals from the clutches of the commercial uh, publishers and saying, and the thing is, if your entire editorial board goes, all of the prestige goes with them, right? It's not the name of the publisher. It's actually the people who are on the editorial board. And that's happening increasingly often. Online publishing is actually not very expensive. People are starting to do serious investigations into the marginal costs of running online journals. It turns out if you pay a vendor for every step, so somebody to manage the website and to do the editorial controls and everything else, um, you're going to pay $70 to $300 per article posted. Um, if you do it yourself, it's between 2 and 10 Okay, so you, you've got the... So the, the software tools aren't there yet, but they're coming. Uh, Preprint servers are standard in some fields. The archive's been around for a long time. Their running costs are $10 per paper, and they've got 1.2 million manuscripts. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of new, new entrants. So BioArchive, F1000, and PeerJ are just the most popular, but there are lots of other ones in that field. So can you say what a preprint server is? It just holds, it holds pre-peer review papers. Yeah. And then uh, preprints are accepted by the major funders now, so you can cite yeah. preprints in your grant applications and they're considered <coughs> as other publications would be. They may ask you for a copy, but you're allowed to sell them. And then overlay journals are this idea of essentially sitting on top of a preprint repository and deciding what to publish. And that may be involve a peer review process, it may involve an editing process and all this sort of thing. But now the idea being that uh, researchers publish their work, it goes through a post-publication of some form or a post-publication assessment and the journal can make its name by choosing the best, the best. Yeah. Okay, so it, just, it changes the model of news using the following situation. This is my last slide. There's a whole set of, the next slide, there's a whole set of readings, mostly which are not the like popular ones, but the underlying core documents, if you want to, they're all wrong and governmental. So the real problem with academic publishing, entrenched systems of prestige, incentive and funding in academia. Fundamentally, it's not the publishers, it's us. We're the problem. That's all. Thank you. That's great. Um, Maya, thank you for an entertaining uh, tour of the issues involved.